Hello, and welcome to Roundtable Mindset, the podcast where we seek to understand and share different perspectives in order to grow and challenge our own. And we encourage you, our guests, to do the same. Each week, we will pick a topic to discuss sharing our own unique thoughts and insights. There will be times when we won't agree, and let's be real, that'll probably be most of the time, and that's okay. We feel it's important to understand that we can live in this polarized world and still respect one another and even be friends. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Roundtable Mindset. Um, as usual, this is Malin. And this is Jamie. Um, and we are actually going to be talking about something um, a little bit exciting today. So if you remember in our uh, past episodes, we talked about how sometimes these conversations could get a little bit heated or divisive. Um, I think I think this is going to be one of those, those topics. So uh, Jamie, if you don't mind, I, I would like to have us discuss today something that I've seen in the news for a while now um, as a parent of kids in school. Uh, we were exposed to this and we kind of lived through it. And that is banning books in schools. Yes. Excited to dissect that with you and share my perspective. Um, <laughs> but before we get into that, um, I wanted to tell you about this thing that happened this week, this space that that I utilize to get perspective. So I tell I tell people, I tell my kids, I tell youth that I work with, that TikTok keeps me relevant, right? So I watch the TikTok so that I'm down with all of the things and I understand what's happening, right? Um, but one of the things that TikTok does for me is give me, gives me lived like perspective from other people, or I guess it helps me see uh, how their experiences might differ from mine. Because I think the the nature of the platform is just so raw. It's short. It, you know what I'm saying? Like, are you are you with me? So I am also a TikToker. Although I don't produce content, I do enjoy logging on and seeing uh, what other people are putting on there. I think it's very entertaining. I guess I've never looked at it as a window into people's lives or getting different perspectives. To me, it's almost been like a remember the real world, those reality. <laughs> reality shows mm -hmm. it's like a little 30 second reality show that i get to kind of peer into people's lives and then kind of back out of it um so no i've never really thought about it how it would impact or shape my perspective well and this could be the difference in our algorithm i'm not gonna lie i've seen some of the tiktoks you share with me my my algorithm looks something okay. like that my for you page is way different okay. so <laughs> just to clarify because there's people listening now jamie there is nothing oh, bad with my for you page. It's just different no. content as in I go for humor, for jokes, comedians. Yes. <laughs> so I just wanted to put that plug in there as people's minds are running wild that my for you page is a for you page. It is not. Okay. No. no. Sorry. Just, I just wanted to clean that up a little bit. Go ahead. No, that's probably very fair. Thank you for doing that because I wasn't even thinking that way myself. So the point is, is that this week I was watching the TikToks and there was this video from a teacher about like her kiddos coming into the classroom in the morning and how she greets them every morning. And they come in and, and the, what, what she has them do is, is state a self-affirmation. One of the kids says, I can do hard things. And she says, yes, you can. And they high five and go into the classroom. And then the next one comes up and the next one comes up and the next one comes up. I think what I've been kind of like running through my mind all week is, is really how cool it is that kids are so quick to be like, I can do hard things. And one, one of them was awesome. She just said, I am awesome. <laughs> And her teacher was like, yes, you are. And how valuable that must be for those kids and how empowering that is when they go into their classroom every morning to just be able to say out loud, I am awesome and be cool with that. And so I've been kind of on this journey this week of thinking like, what is it about little kids that they are so ready to accept? I am awesome. I can do hard things. I am smart. I am brave. I'm beautiful, whatever. And as adults, we struggle so much to find those pieces of ourselves and to be empowered in that way. So I've, I've just been kind of ruminating on that and thinking about how we talk about perspective so much. We use the word exhaustively, let's be honest. But 
how so much of that is about as adults, we're gaining these different viewpoints, these different experiences, and how important sometimes it is to just stop and look at things like kids do and to remember that they have valuable perspectives to give us as well. So that was that was my food for thought this week. No, I love that. I love that, Jamie, because at one point in time, we were all kids that believed that I'm awesome because I just am. And I don't need other people to believe it because I believe it. And that's enough. And somewhere along the lines between crayons and cars, we lose that ability to look at ourselves and just accept I- I'm awesome. I'm OK where I'm at. I like who I am. I don't need to be anything more than what I'm right now. And, you know, I've also learned that maybe I should change my algorithm on TikTok a little bit because that's nothing like that ever shows up on my for for you feed. So um, (laughs) there's that. But I do think that as I'm reflecting on my own life now, even the perspectives that we talked about on the show the last few episodes, not one time did it cross into my mind How can I use a lens or a different way of thinking to help me feel better about myself or accept that, you know what, there are days where I just feel awesome and I've done nothing to really deserve it, but I'm just awesome. It's been a while since I felt like that. And you're stirring a lot of, a lot of things up in me right now when I'm trying to, you know, find the words to, to share how that's, how that skill as a child is just in them. And that's something that as adults, it feels like we try our whole lives to get it. Question that bubbles out of me is when did we lose it? When does that go away? Who squashed it? I think it's middle school. This is what I, this is my personal belief system. Middle school kind of beats it out of us because middle school is hard, but I will say middle school was hard. (laughs) I mean, yes, everything's changing. Your body's changing. Your social structure's changing responsibilities are changing (laughs) your shoes are changing because you don't fit into them anymore like there's a lot of change in middle school yes yes (laughs) i will say just to kind of tack onto this for just a second that um my youngest son who is 11 he knows that i'm podcasting and of course he wants to podcast so we got him a microphone and you want to talk about something humbling jamie we talked about, you know, it took us weeks to unpack the equipment, put it together, learn how to use it. And then also we recorded and deleted and recorded and deleted and recorded and deleted just in the hopes that we didn't sound like morons or sound stupid. This child unwrapped his microphone in a matter of 30 seconds, popped it into his computer and within the first 20 minutes, had a 15-minute podcast episode. Okay, I have to know what it was about. Can, what what was this podcast about? Because I can't wait to hear it. Well, I don't think he's going to post it. I'm just saying he's recording it. But the confidence that he had in saying, what I just did is ready to be going out to the masses. I think it had something to do with how he built his Lego car or something like that. But again... I just marveled at this kid that's that had no worries that is my content good enough? Am I good enough? Am I talking about the right stuff? Are people going to believe me? Are people going to think I'm boring? Am I interesting enough? He didn't even think about any of that. He just thought about, I have a microphone. I have something to talk about. People will want to listen to this. And he just went for it. I wish I could take some of that and apply it to my life. But again, when did we lose that ability? I don't know. thought that that might be a good segue as we're starting out this little bit different flavor of our podcast today. Um, just to think about it ties in with school. It ties in with our kids and how important it is to foster that confidence and that empowerment in our, in our young ones that we'd be talking about this topic today so Um, so book banning (laughs) yeah dun 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 well and i don't think it has to be quite so dun 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 but (laughs) here's my perspective on the whole book banning and i think i want to jump in first because i want to make sure that my i think my stance is going to be different than yours i'd be surprised if it's not i think calling it book banning that's an outcome banning some books from the school is an outcome I think what I'm more in favor of and alignment with is supervision of what types of books come into the school and monitoring the, the, the curriculum, monitoring the types of books that kids can check out at their at the libraries within the school. To me, that's what I'm in favor of. 
If the outcome is because we find material or books that are not appropriate and banning them from the schools, that I'm okay with. Just labeling a a label across all of it that says books need to be banned. I am not for just banning books from adults. I think once you become age appropriate and you become an adult, read whatever you want. That you know that's what makes this country great. So I just wanted to make that distinction, Jamie. It's probably around I'm in favor of regulating the types of reading material and books that come into our school system. If that results in banning books, great. But I'm not just for banning books as a whole. Well, and that I appreciate that. And I appreciate the disclaimer to get started because that helps to, it helps to understand. And I do hate how we have a tendency to, or I don't know, I don't know who it is that does these things, that labels these things like book batting, you know, as if, as if that's the entire goal of the whole thing. But um, do you have any idea? what the process is at your kid's high school um, for putting a book in the library. Do you have any idea what that looks like for your school district? So the short answer is I no, I don't know all of the steps, but here's what I do know. I do know that some of the curriculum, I shouldn't say some, the curriculum has to be approved by the school board. The books that are inside the library, that I do not know, but I, I have a strong strong inclination that it does not go through the same rigor that the curriculum does because there has been instances in our local school board that they have discovered books in the library that they were not aware were there. So short answer, no, I don't. But I, based off the, the experiences and the examples I just gave, I have a strong feeling they are two separate processes. Do you have any idea? I No, I do. I know that just similarly that the curriculum is there is a there's a whole process to that um and i don't understand each step of of the process in our local school district and i don't know that that is i don't know how extremely relevant that is in this discussion because it is going to be so different by varying school district to school district right because each school district gets to make up their own rules and and the state governs those things and such so I'm not sure how super relevant that is, other than to say (laughs) we're having a discussion and we're not sure how that process is in our own schools. Like that to me is probably, it's probably step one. I need to understand that process if I want to have a voice in that in my local school district, I think. Well, and, and again, for my local school district, I agree with you. In fact, something that I think you and I have talked about, again, off, off the podcast Mike's is I'm have an interest in going into possibly running for the local school board um, in my school district. And so that's something that I'm starting to seriously entertain. Uh, Again, I don't want this to be a political statement or a political episode, but back when COVID and, you know, Trump and Biden elections, all that was going on. One of the things that I was getting you know, I was getting mad about was all these things are happening to me. I was, I'm not going to say I I was playing the victim card, although I can see how I was wallowing. I'll accept wallowing where, you know, all these changes are happening to me. I don't have a voice. How do I get involved? And I stopped myself and I was like, no, I can get involved. There's things at the local level of my, you know, community and my government that I can do that can start impacting some of these things so I don't feel quite so so helpless. And so <clears throat> one of the things I, I did is I signed up. So I helped with the polling, the voting polls when they come around. So that was one thing that made me feel a little bit better. And the second thing that I was going to do is get involved in the, the school board. And so um, you're right. I don't know how that process works today, but I think that's something that I want to learn, especially if I'm getting interested into what that means to be on the school board. But if we can just maybe talk about not the semantics of how you know these decisions are made i guess to the heart of the question and maybe and it, it maybe it's not as black and white uh, but are you are you for or against regulating the material that goes into schools are you are you okay with where that where that's at today i know your kids have kind of grown out of the public school system now my kids are still in the thick of things. So our viewpoints on that 
regard might be a little bit different, but you, you've brought two kids through the school system. So you've, you've had the same, actually, you're probably ahead of where I'm at because I only had one child in high school and you've already had two of yours pass through it. So, yeah, I think, well, and the reason I bring that up is because that was my, that was my thought. Like, I know that there's lots of things that's not available in the public school library, right? I mean, there's, there's things that anyone could look at and be like, well, that doesn't seem appropriate for a high school library or a middle school library or a grade school library. So clearly there's already a process in place where there is some, some determination about what books should be provided to youth and what books should not be provided to youth. And that's, I think, I, I, that's where, kind of where I started. Like, well, gosh, I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know what those rules are. Speaking to your point, curriculum has a much more stringent set of guidelines i'm sure because of the nature of the fact that it's not a vol- it, that's not voluntary what our kids are learning in this the textbooks that they're using is not a voluntary choice on our kids part that's something every student is going to to encounter um, whereas the books in the library that is more voluntary it is more of a of a free choice of our kids as to which books they choose to read so it makes sense to me i guess that there's there's a difference in that process. Um, yeah, but w- as far as oh, go ahead. oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, well, I was just going to say, I think for for me, if you want the big scary banner of book batting for or against, I'm going to say against. Um, I'm going to say that our schools, we elect a school board who we trust to make decisions in leadership for our schools. So our school board hires a superintendent and our superintendent hires principals and our principals hire teachers. And to me, this is not, I guess this is not blind or mindless, but I do believe that teachers, teachers go through a lot more education about what's developmentally appropriate for kids. They understand the age levels that they're working with. They are highly qualified professionals who agree to adhere to a code of ethics. I'm going to trust and have trusted for 12 years that they're going to educate my children and teach them what they need to know. So I'm not afraid of my school making those decisions. If my kids bring home a book that I don't think is appropriate, I have every right to say, hey, is this appropriate? Let's talk about why you're reading it. Let's talk about what's in it. You don't have that conversation with my kiddos, but they're going to get their hands on whatever they want to read anyway right yeah but so going back for just a second so i do agree with you that curriculum and books that you can just go check in the library different regulations i'm assuming again i don't know for a fact um so that's a very good point but again based off of the examples i feel like they are two different paths but it's not always for leisure reading that these books are being introduced because in a lot of the classes, part of the curriculum, you have to do a book report. And so sometimes these book reports are assigned to kids and sometimes they're not. And so even though the curriculum leaves that open for the kids to make the choice, they're still going to a resource repository where they could select material that are not appropriate for their age because somehow that material has found its way into the library. So although I agree with you, curriculum is a lot more, feels like it's a lot more regulated than just what books are in the library. I don't think they are mutually exclusive from one another. And it's not always the kids just get to leisurely read. They, it is tied somewhat to the curriculum. Um, just it doesn't maybe spell out what book that they have to read. Um, and again, I guess my issue is I just want to make sure that first need to learn how that process even takes place. Who who in the school district is monitoring the books that are coming in, approving the books that are coming in, buying the books that are coming in? That is number one. Number two, how do I get my voice in the ring to say, I want to start shaping what those regulations look like? As a parent, I want to attend school board meetings. If that's who has the ultimate say, I want to meet with my local principal. If he's the one that's buying them, um, whoever it is, I want to make sure that I'm right there because some of the material that is in an elementary school, a middle school, or a high school, I want to make sure it's it's age appropriate. 
And right now, even in our school library, I can say when I've gone to parent teacher conferences and I've walked through the library, there's, there's been some books in the elementary school that I was a little surprised would be there. Um, as well as my daughter's brought home books before where she's reading about very adult situations and content. And this was when she was, you know, 14, 15 years old that I didn't really appreciate and quite frankly was a little surprised that would be in a school library. So I think, I think that's almost, it's almost like the second phase of this conversation, I think, then what should be there and what shouldn't be there, right? I am going to take some time, I think, and find out what, what the schools do. What is that list of criteria that makes a book acceptable or makes a book unacceptable? I don't know who makes that choices. I'm going to guess it's not a principal. I'm hoping it's like a librarian, you know someone who has a degree in literature with children and education and that kind of thing. I know teachers get to make decisions about what books are in their classroom. And again, you know, we've hired these folks who graduate from colleges understanding that they're adhering to a code of ethics as a teacher, right? Even in my line of work, which is, it's not as qualifying as being a teacher. Like, there's an education requirement for being a teacher and there's not an education requirement for my my set of jobs that I've done. But I have a code of ethics and a set of values that we adhere to in my profession. I don't know if that's something that you experience in your profession, but a lot of these human service jobs have this, right? So then there's a whole process. If a librarian goes rogue <laughs> and decides to get a whole bunch of books that aren't okay, um, there's a process to that. You violated this this ethical code and you will have to answer for violating this ethical code. I think why this is so frustrating for me personally is because it's like inherent belief that we can't trust them to do their job or something. You know what I mean? Like, why can't we why can't we know that we have hired people to implement a set of rules and regulations that come from not just our local districts, but state and national guidelines as well. Why can't we trust that they want what's best for our kids too? That they got into teaching because they wanted to educate kids. They wanted to teach kids, right? Why why is that? I think first of all, I'm going to go on a little caveat here. I think teachers are underpaid and overworked and underappreciated in t- in today's society. I think they're expected to do to run miles when they're only given inches to work with. And my hat goes off to him. I could not be a teacher even 20 years ago. I couldn't be a teacher. And there's no way on God's green earth I could be a teacher in today's society. So before I even begin talking, I want hats off to all teachers listening, not listening throughout the entire country. I respect you. I think your profession is honorable. I think you're doing the best you can. But I also think that your hands are tied a lot of ways. So with that, I will say, to answer your question, Jamie, for me, it does come down to a religious tone. And what I mean by that is there are things that are creeping into the school system that teaching my kid to read, write, view history, arithmetic, all of that is wonderful. But there's also this subculture that seems to be leaking in. I know you hate the word, you know, woke. And so I don't like, I don't want to use that too much, but there is a subculture that's coming in and it's disguising itself in the form of tolerance. And I'm not against tolerance. I think everybody should be, you know, looked at as equal. I think, you know, regardless of your gender, your skin color, your sexual orientation, everybody should be the same. However, what's happening in the subculture, and I'll just take one example to kind of keep it in the religious theme. We went to our child's parent teacher conference And there's a book fair going on. So I go into the library and I'm looking around and there's actually a section on religions, which I thought, wow, that's really impressive that they have a book on religions. And so I start thumbing through those and there's a section for every, and I'm not going to color it. I'm not going to be exaggerative here. There is a section for a, for many of the world religions. Um, I saw Mormonism. I saw saw um, Muslim. Uh, There was things even about, you know, Israel um, being Hebrew, 
all uh, Kwanzaa was there. I mean, there was all these different representations, and the only representation that wasn't there was Christian. And the section was was just gone. There there was there was no place for even Christian books to be there. So I was talking with the librarian. And I was asking about that section. And again, very proud. Yes, we have all these different religions. And I said, but you don't have Christianity. If you're going to inject that kind of material into the library, then it needs to be needs to be complete. And so that's just one example where I don't discount the teachers that are working and they're wanting to educate my children. It's the environment that they have to do that in. And that subculture that seems to be leaking in, that is the answer to your question. It's not the teachers themselves, but it's maybe the structure, the environment, the institution that they have to work under that I'm starting to have problems with. I think it's uh, it's interesting to me, I guess, to think about religions. You call them religions. Some of those religions are also culture. You know what I mean? And And I'm... I'm in the middle of a human services class, and I know we've talked about culture and religion and race and ethnicity and all of these different things. But, you know, if you think about some religions, it's not just about the religion. It's about where they come from. It can be part of the culture, too. So is it what was it just religious content or was it really cultural content that you saw? Um, well, I think at the elementary, it's not going to have Hebrew scrolls sitting there. It's not going to have... Clearly. Right. It's not going to have the Quran in, in the shelf. It's going to have books that have to do with that culture, that religion, those religious um, icons and, and flags and, you know, all these different things. I think there there was, um, even within the section, you know, there was Kwanzaa, there was Hanukkah, there was all these different things. And so, yes, to your point, it was probably a collection of both. But you could clearly see the connection between here's all these books talking about all these different cultures, all these different, and I'll say religions, because it does start entertaining some of that. But there was nothing around Christianity that was in there. And do you think, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> well, I was going to say, do you think some of that is because, I mean, Christianity is so mainstream in America. What you're saying is Kwanzaa and Hanukkah, and you're listing some like religious holidays or celebrations. We all know Christmas. We all know Easter. Most families celebrate that. I would imagine it would be the same in your state as it is in mine. Is it really because we feel that our kids don't have access to that? Because I'm pretty sure that a lot of kids don't have access to a friend down the street that might practice Judaism. And th so there's not opportunity for kids to learn about that. Whereas Christianity is so accessible, do we really need to explicitly put that out there that way? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but if you use that, if you use that example as when it's okay to exclude and when it's okay to include, who gets to decide, who decides then when that is, I'm using air quotes, mainstream enough that it doesn't need to be represented with these other books that are also available. Do you disagree that Christianity is pretty mainstream? And do you think, do you really think there's many people in America that doesn't know how to access Christianity in some way? So my question to that would be, I think there's a lot of people who think they know what being a Christian's about. And I think they know the word Jesus. Do they know? I, I'm not talking like the basis of Christian, like, do you understand Christianity? That's not even what I'm saying. What I'm saying is access. Is there really anyone, anyone over the age of, I would even say 10 or 13 or 15, right, that doesn't know how to access Christianity if they wanted to? Well, but then in, in that argument, Jamie, we could get rid of libraries altogether because we have the internet, right? So anybody can access anything they want. If a child knows how to look up Judaism, they can go to Google search and put in Judaism and all of a sudden all these articles come up. I guess for- Well, the difference- the difference for me is living in a rural area, not every family does have access to reliable internet service. So, but I'll tell you what, as a kid growing up in that tiny town that we grew up in, I could tell you even today how far churches were from my house. And um, I remember one time we were over, not we, I was over, um, I think it was done with t-ball practice or something. And there was a Catholic church that was always open, always open because they had space to go and do the rosary and, and stuff. And I, I totally went in once just out of curiosity. 
I, like even as a young kid, I knew how to access Christianity if I wanted it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I think entering a church and accessing Christianity, again, the fundamental pieces of being a Christian and understanding that are the, the pieces that I was talking about. Um, and let's go to Easter because, you know, that's coming up as a, as a holiday that's kind of close to us right now. Going and looking at those books around Kwanzaa and Hanukkah and all those other religious holidays, there was no Easter books there. And so you talk about do people have access to Christianity more? So that's why it doesn't need to be in a library. I would have to have to answer you as no, I don't I don't think it is as, as prevalent as it used to be. I don't think it is open to people as much as it used to be. I think there is a lot of things shifting in our culture. And this is, again, in my belief, a, a good example of how it's being pushed out or forgotten. Because, again, everything that both of, I, both of us have been talking about, what would it have hurt to just include Easter books or a Noah's Ark or some other Christian either tradition or holiday alongside those other religions to just blatantly not have a section there for it, even though some might say that it is very prevalent in our society and in, in, in the United States. If you're going to make room for religion in any form, religious holidays, artifacts, whatever it is, then why can't you be inclusive to Christianity, even if it is the most predominant and people know the most about that one in, in the United States than any other? why not still have a section? Because there might be kids that are coming over from different cultures. Um, we have, you know, in the areas that I live in, Jamie, we have a, a, a more diverse mix of kids than what we did. I'm sorry to say, but when we went to school, um, I think there was, you know, a handful of kids that were not Caucasian, I'll say it that way. And the amount of kids that my children are exposed to that are you know, not white is, is phenomenal to me. Like, it just amazes me. I love that for them. But then it starts thinking, you know, you start meeting these families that come over from other countries and they may not have ever heard about Christianity. And to your point, if these books are there for us, we don't know a lot about Judaism or even you know, the certain holidays like Kwanzaa. Well, those kids and those individuals might not know a lot about Christianity and they may be interested in knowing and learning about those cultures that are here that they haven't heard before. Well, and I don't know that I disagree, but I guess my instant thought goes to whoever is in charge of choosing the books for that school. If I'm looking at, I have X amount of dollars and these are the areas where I see we could bolster information in our library. I'm, I'm wondering if it wasn't like a blatant disregard as much as a, you know, we, we don't have, because I'm positive there's other books in there that probably do have some some Christian themes that are maybe not just part of the title of the book or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's themes in books that, that can, and, and I know in our high school, we had, we had a Bible in our library. Um, actually, I think we had a bunch of them. And some, one of our classes, we did some, like one of our English classes, we kind of dissected some, some portions of the Bible too. So, you know, I just wonder if it wasn't my inclination and my automatic assumption would be, okay, this is someone who had a limited budget and is trying to build a section of the library that probably hasn't existed before. You know what I'm saying? Like, Well, and I also want to go down the avenue of, I, I, don't, I don't think best of intentions, right? As I'm stuttering over my own words. I, I do believe people have the best of intentions. Unless proven otherwise, I can't imagine individuals choosing to hand select books for a devious reason other than to try to educate children. The only caveat to that is, is I think, again, that subculture that's that I mentioned earlier, what I perceive that agenda to be is bringing more adult content into younger and younger viewers' hands. And again, there's books that are in the elementary library that talk about more adult-related things. Um, you know, again, walking the the library of my son's elementary school, there's books on what I would what I would say we didn't see Jamie until we were well into middle school. So, you know, there's talking about death and there's there's relationships happening and there's 
um, multi-tiered relationships within these books happening um, nowadays. So it's not just between a man and a woman, but there's woman and women, man and man. And it goes into a little bit more detail than just they held hands or maybe they kissed on the cheek. Like there's a little bit more provocativeness that's being leaked into these books. And they're showing up on shelves for these kids that are younger and younger. And as far as I know, when I was asking my son, there's no special section that only a fifth grader can go and read off of a certain shelf. So um, there's a there's a skill level, a reading level, right? So I don't expect a kindergartner usually to walk over and read something that's in the fifth grade section um, because they might not be at that skill set. Uh, uh, set and they may not be able to, but if they were, they would have the ability to grow, grab any book that they want and instantly start exposing them to things that in my mind, um, would be things that I wouldn't want my kindergartner, first grader, second grader, or even my fifth grader to be reading about right now. And so, and, and again, a lot of my firsthand experience comes from me talking with my children who I happen to have in the elementary level, the middle school level, and at the high school level. And when I talk to them about these things, um, so that that's kind of where I'm getting this. There are my I again, my daughter brought home books since she's been in high school on book reports that she has to do. And some of this content, I'm like, I can't believe you were reading this. Why, why has this book been assigned? And to your point earlier, Jamie, sometimes they're not assigned. Sometimes the the assignment is go get a book and do a book report upon it. And that just happened to be one of the books that she grabbed. But that goes back to my earlier point. If there was some sort of, and I'm sure there's at some level there, there is, but if there was some sort of process or regulatory review of these books to make sure that they are age appropriate and that they are not falling into younger kids' hands, that would make me feel better. And I know we've already beat this dead horse. That might exist, and I need to identify what that is. But I also want to be part of that process just to make sure that I'm helping shape that subculture, that it's not just all this external or from the institution weighing in on it, that there is some outside influence in the form of parents and guardians uh, having a say in that as well. I would agree with you, Malin, um, <laughs> that going in, well, and that's kind of why I started this conversation that way, because I really felt like, you know, until I have, until I have a good feeling of what that process looks like, I, I cannot come from a space of having any sort of expertise over people who have an education and have been trained to do this work, right? When we talk about, though, like, we talk about content and what you're comfortable with your kiddo reading, I think that's probably, it's probably another side of this argument, another facet of, of the conversation, just because I think back to high school, right? Probably most of the books that I remember reading for school was in high school, maybe a couple in middle school. They, they weren't all like kumbaya. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I read Animal Farm. Did you read, read Animal Farm? Uh, sure did. Did you read Lord of the Flies? No, that one we didn't have to read. Okay. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. Oedipus the King. No. We did read some sections of the Bible, but, you know, I mean, just even those, those books alone, the ones that I, that I was kind of reflecting on. Oh, The Outsiders. Did you read The Outsiders? I remember that one too. Nope. You didn't? Uh -uh. Wow. High school, high school, two hours away was very different for you than it was for me. <laughs> yes, it was. Different, different um, sized towns too, so resources yeah, are suppose, different i suppose but those were i mean those were books you know romeo and juliet i all of these things we i mean we had a shakespeare we had a shakespeare session section in every english class throughout high school um those books aren't shy in what could be deemed as inappropriate content um the outsiders has teen violence and you know drug use and animal farm was cute and cuddly animals that were like little communist on a farm with a really bad farmer um, and they just kind of take over the farm and run it their own way. Oedipus the King, like the whole plot was he was, the gods told him to go and kill his dad and marry his mom. What? Um, but what's the point? Like what, what did we learn in that? What was the value in reading these books? What, what, 
you know, what object lessons did we gain from that? And I think to answer some of that, we have to really go back to what the purpose is. What's the purpose in, in writing these books? What's the purpose in reading these books? What do we gain as a teenager or as a young, younger than teenager, <laughs> like middle schooler? What do we gain from that? Well, I think your example there I'm comfortable with because you said in high school. So it's not that I don't think these books don't have a place in the school system. I just want to make sure that they are being distributed at the right levels, the right age appropriate levels, because I wouldn't want Oedipus to be available for maybe middle schoolers and definitely not elementary school. But if it's just showing up in there and there's no oversight into what's being into those different libraries, that's when I'm in favor of regula regulations. Somebody overseeing the type of content that's going into these libraries and kind of making sure that they are distributed appropriately. So it's not so much the content on all of these books you named, also, although there are some books that I think I would not put in any of the public school system and I would have them in a regular library. So when you're an adult, and I understand that my argument, as I'm saying out loud, there's nothing that stops kids from just going to a public library and checking them out. Well, if you recognize that they can just walk into a public library and get the same thing, why, I guess, what is the, <laughs> it's no one is force feeding these books. Well, except for the ones that I mentioned that I read in class. And let's be super honest. I could barely understand Oedipus the King as a sophomore in high school. There's no way your fifth grader is going to understand it. I'm just saying. <laughs> we just put that out there. Well, and that's what I'm talking about, your <laughs> skill level. But again, why are these, why are some of these books even showing up? But I guess what I'm saying is when we're, in an institution where we are educating young minds, if there's ever a place to make sure that we're distributing the right age appropriate content, it would be there. Well, it's interesting you say that. I did a little prep work. I, uh, I did some Googling because I was curious about these books. Like I was curious, what books are we talking about? I don't know if they still read Oedipus the King at the high school I graduated from. Um, I don't know. I do know they still do Outsiders. They still do Animal Farm. You know, most of those books they still do. But I don't know for sure. So I wanted to go and look like what are what books are we talking about? Right. Um, and there's a list. This list was done by Penn America, which is uh, it was cited several times by other like this. This study was cited several times by other websites and other articles. But they did like a, a report in 2022. And. They said that there was 1,648 unique book titles that were banned in this in the 2021-2022 school year. So does it say from um, does it say from where like in in general throughout the United States in different locations, one area of the United States? Yes, there's a whole like list of what books were banned from what schools. I can tell you that Texas and Florida, Texas ranked number one. Among the states with the most bans, 181 or 801 book bans in 22 school districts. And Florida was second with 566 in 21 school districts. Pennsylvania also made the list at 457 bans in 11 different school districts. So, and this is, I guess what was interesting in reading through some of this information is that this isn't something that's new. It's almost like it's something that's just newly popularized or something. Schools have been doing this. Schools have been scrutinizing. Parents have been taking books to the school and saying, hey, I'm not sure that this is appropriate for my kid to read. And schools, most schools have a process to go through those and say, yeah, this is this. Uh, maybe this isn't OK. And we're going to take this one off the shelves. This has been happening for years. As a matter of fact, I mentioned earlier, we, we read To Kill a Mockingbird. That was a book that has that has been banned off and on in different school districts for different reasons. Um, what I thought was interesting, though, is of those 1,648 unique book titles, 41% um, of them explicitly ex address LGBTQ plus themes or have LGBTQ plus like protagonists. 40% of them have characters that that are main characters or secondary strong secondary characters of color and 388 of those or th sorry 338 of those books or 21 percent are directly uh, those books directly address issues of race so if you add that up that is most of those books most of those books are being banned because of themes of race 
gender, sexual orientation. That says something to me that that is um, that's about more than just inappropriate content. You know what I'm saying? Well, it depends because just because we have a list of topics that these were brought under, does it really clarify what content was in each of the books? So if there was, I'm just going to go on a limb here, severe pornographic material, and it just so happened that the main character was gay or the main character was black or Latino or you know some other race, would it have fallen into one of those or would it have been classified as, oh, this is s- sexual content that's not appropriate for young children? So although I appreciate the list, it seems to be a little bit incomplete for me because it doesn't give any context to what was the, ma- unless you have more, it gives context to what the material inside these categories we're talking about. Well, I'm, I, yes, there's, there's all, I'm not going to lie. There is a lot of information in this report and there was 1,648 books. It's a lot of books. So I did not review each and every single one of them. This feels to me like that's a little discriminatory. You know what I mean? That, that if, if, so many of those books are being removed because of gender identity or sexual orientation or race based that's that's a whole different ball game for me um as far as what and i guess i go back to that point what do we what do we read for what do we when we read these stories what is it for what's the purpose so often there was a <laughs> one of the books that i read in high school i literally i went and got it from the library it was sleeping with the enemy Totally made into a popular movie good with movie. Julia Roberts. That was a good movie. Great movie. Great movie. Um, well, I read the book before I watched the movie, and uh, I just found it in the library. I thought the cover was intriguing, and I'm pretty sure it was the movie poster as the cover. So I'm I'm positive. I'm a huge Julia Roberts fan, so I'm positive this is why I picked up the book. But I really couldn't believe what I was reading. I could not believe that what I was reading was available in our school library. I mean, I was just ingesting this book so fast. I I read it cover to cover in just a matter of days as a full-time student with a job because, uh, not because of the content, not because of, you know, I had some gory need for the, for that inappropriate stuff. What I did get out of it is a story of empowerment, a story of someone who found freedom from domestic violence. Um, As an adult, I can look back and say, I learned what that looked like. And I learned what that could do to a person. And I don't even remember. I just remember that fleeting thought of how is this in our school library? I don't remember what that content is. I remember the overarching lesson, the story um, that impacted me and those lessons that stayed with me. And so having books in our in our school libraries where kids can see themselves or where they can imagine themselves or where they can place it next to their own narrative gives them the opportunity to do exactly what we're trying to do on this podcast. You know what I mean? Like to be able to experience life from a different place, from a different point of view, through a different lens. And to be able to make sense of our own experience in that way. So when I saw this study, I was so saddened by the fact that so many of those books were were banned because of what feels like a very political agenda against specific groups of people in our country. Well, and I think it's I think there's two things that I find interesting with that. The first, and I'm gonna say it as my number one, so you will actually listen to it because the second one I think you're gonna blow up at me. But the first one is, I think is, you know, that those are all great lessons. And I think they just needs to make sure that we're at the appropriate level. So um, again, without knowing the context behind that list of, you know, however many of them have to do with sexual orientation, uh, some of them have to do with race, some of them have to do, uh, you know, the protagonist uh, of the story is gay. And so that's on the list. But what was in the book that made it get banned? What was it being questioned? Because I've seen a lot of statistics where things are kind of rolled up underneath an umbrella and you miss out on the details of, well, there was this rape scene in the, in the book that went into gory detail. Does that get categorized as, well, the main character was gay. So now you're banning a book because it has to do with someone's sexual orientation. No, has nothing to do with their sexual orientation, has everything to do with there is this scene that is gross and really graphic that I don't think our children in any grade needs to be reading at that time. So again, it's hard for me to understand what that list really means. 
And number two is the same people that we were just talking about that you were championing that have the degrees, that have the education, that know how to educate children and have the best intention for them. And these states are also the exact same ones that are banning these books for whatever reason. And so you can almost, if you change the lens a little bit, you can almost see the argument that you did earlier kind of play into this argument. Depending on how you're approaching and the problem you're trying to solve, I could see where both sides of those arguments would fit nicely. But I just had to kind of chuckle to myself because beginning of this conversation, and I agree with you, they're educated, they're trying to do the best for the children, blah, blah, blah. These are the same individuals now that are deciding that these books need to be banned. And yet there's a problem with that. Well, and I guess let me let me clarify just a little bit, because another and and I don't I don't have that article sitting in front of my face, so I can't I can't recall numbers and things like that. But they did talk about how the number of books that are being banned in a school are going up year after year for the last three years, two years, something like that. And I did read one. It was more like a news newsy sort of article that said that if things stay in the trajectory that it has been so far this school year, there will be even more books. So to me, that says, yes, I think public schools have done their job, that they look at these things and they scrutinize them. And if something is brought up that is a concern that maybe it wasn't looked at that way before, that they remove that book. But I don't think that necessarily we're saying that Texas teachers are saying, oh my gosh, all of our books are terrible. Let's ban them because they have terrible content for our kids. I think that there is an outside thing that's happening where, you know, parents are coming to school board meetings and saying these books are not okay because they don't agree with my religious values or these books are not okay because they don't agree with my um, my belief system. And that's a whole different thing for, and, and school district, there are some school districts that have a really hard time not bending to that. The takeaway, because again, I love taking stuff away and mulling it over, is I'm going to go learn what exactly does that mean? How does book? How do books get into the school system? And listeners, what you don't know is we had to do a small pause. And while we were on a small pause, I did do a quick, quick Google search. And I'm not even going to say this is research. I'm just saying I was curious, how does this happen? And I found that there's three avenues that tend to be used to get books into the public school system, which are they get approved by the school board, they get donated by private uh, donations, or the school librarian um, actually uh, can bring them in. Now, what I don't know is if the school librarian and the donations all get ran up through the school board, so the school board has the ultimate say on all books that are coming in, or if these are three avenues that are operating exclusively from each other. And I think that's what I want to go research and know more about, because I would hope that they come up at least underneath the school board who has the final say. At least there's some consistent regulation then that's happening, or at least oversight. But I, I, I do think, Jamie, that question that you posed at the very beginning was very interesting because I never took the time to say, well, how does that actually work? And I want to, I want to know more. So that's my ho- That's my takeaway. That's my homework. Well, and I agree. Um, and actually, plan to do the same for for our local school district as well. And and I guess I hoped I had hoped that our listeners could could see that as as a step. Like, what can I do? What what steps can I take? And that's learn about these processes. You know, talk with people who are who are in it. I I did visit with um, my daughter a bit before this episode and, and just kind of got her perspective. And, and I was curious to know what she thinks and, and how she feels about it. So um, I think the conversations are so good. And what's important is that we, we can have the conversation. We can walk away and be okay. That, you know, Malin and I obviously don't necessarily agree on all of the points, the salient points. We might agree on some of the bigger ones, but, but, you know, it's, it, it causes me to think. It causes me to go and look more. Even thinking about doing this podcast made me think, huh, what do I need to know before I get on here, right? <laughs> so, I think the positive for both of us, I, I don't, I, at least I hope we don't argue this point, is it's getting us both to think about this topic. And that's always a positive. Again, we may not land on the same side of the fence on all 
all avenues, but I think we both can agree that uh, talking about this and understanding more and getting involved, all three things that are positive, regardless of you, which side of the fence that you fall on or what your core beliefs around, you know, oversighting books coming into the public school system or not. I mean, ultimately, what I heard you say, Jamie, is you want the best for the kids that are attending the school. I do too. I just think mm -hmm. our best, we, we look at it a little bit different. And, th and that's okay. And I think that's what makes us, I think that's what makes our conversations interesting. If we got on here and we were like, I believe A, B, and C, and you go, I believe in A, B, and C too, that makes for very short podcasts and very narrow-minded thinking. And so as much as I disagree with, a, with some of the stuff that you've said, I'm at least taking some of that back, challenging myself and breaking open my perspective a little bit. So it's a little uncomfortable on some things, but um, I still enjoy doing it. So thanks. Thanks for the conversation, Jamie. I agree. I agree. I'm going to, uh, I, I, my plan is to read some of these books. The top 10 is going to be where I'm going to start. The top 10 books that were banned in 2021, 2022. I plan to read them what, and see what I think about them. What Jamie's not telling you, she's planning on reading them to kindergartners. I'm just kidding. That was, that's totally a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Out loud okay. at your public library, Jamie reading To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> I, <laughs> Sleeping with the Enemy, uh, One Day Only. Uh, Okay, I wasn't talking about your personal list. I've already read those. I'm going to read some new books, okay? <laughs> oh, we would like to thank you, guests of the roundtable, for joining us today. Um, we would also like to invite you to join the conversation, right, Marilyn? That's right. Hop on in. And you can do that by sending us an email at roundtablemindset at gmail.com. And I don't know, um, by the time this drops, I'm hoping we'll have a phone number that you can call and leave a voicemail because um, that's next. We have an email now, voicemail tomorrow or well, soon. Tomorrow in the podcasting world could mean a couple weeks, but for you, yes. doo -loo -loo, doo -loo -loo, it's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you next week, which really doo -loo -loo, doo -loo -loo, doo -loo is not next week, but we'll see you soon right here at Roundtable Mindset. See you next time. Bye-bye. This podcast was recorded and edited by Jamie and Malin with music by Famous Cats. If you have a topic you'd like us to discuss, please email us at roundtablemindset at gmail.com. And never miss a new episode by making sure you like and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoyed your time with us today, do us a favor and invite a friend. Thanks for listening. Please join us next time at the Roundtable. And remember, your opinion and perspective matter. And we might not see eye to eye, but that's okay.